it was a very sunny morning. I remember waking up and the sun was beaming from the window in my bedroom. I'm from Somalia, so it's a very nice warm country. Let me tell you a little bit about Somalia. We have the longest coast in the world. We are a society of poets, and well, you're not going to get any poetry from me. Just warning you. I woke up that morning and people were cooking. My mother had the usual caterers. You know, I come from a what you would call a privileged Somali family.、Um, my grandparents were doctors.、Uh, my mother was an accountant who worked for the Somali government. My dad was an electrical engineer. But what, this day was really strange. What made it really strange was we had these amazing caterers in the house. There was a lot of colours. I mean, I thought, whose birthday are we celebrating today? It certainly wasn't mine. All of a sudden, my neighbour's daughter comes up to me and she says, "Oh, Layla, you must be really looking forward to today. You know, it's a big day for you." I remember saying, "Well, I don't know what you are talking about because it's not my birthday." In case you haven't noticed, I love birthday celebrations. And she was eight years old. This eight-year-old continued to talk to me, and she told me what was going to happen to me this day. At this point, I'm having this out-of-experience body situation. Within seconds, I hear my sister screaming in the other side of the house. When I say screaming, it was like an animal was being massacred. And within seconds, I heard, "Get Layla! Get Layla! It's her turn! Get Layla now!" I literally ran. I didn't know what the hell I was running from at this point, but I ran. But I'm a little child. I, they grabbed me, got hold of me, took me to this room. I was pinned down. My clothes was taken off. My legs were spread apart. And I was pinned down by women who I trusted, women who I knew. They were aunties, family friends. You know, Somalis were very hospitable people. So I didn't know why this was happening to me. My mother wasn't there as well, so that was really strange. And before I knew it, a sharp knife was taken to my body. And this was done by a doctor. At the age of seven, I've endured a practice called female genital mutilation. Female genital mutilation. It's when you partially or totally remove the female genitalia. I felt all the pain. It's painful. Someone cutting your flesh off, and as a seven-year-old, to undergo such practice by people you trusted, by a medical profession, you can imagine how devastating that was. I still fought back, but again, like I said, I'm a seven-year-old child. There's only so much I can fight. After that happened, I was taken away to a room. I was literally there was a room full of gifts. I got a gold watch. I got sweets. I got chocolates. Actually, no, I didn't get the chocolates because apparently I made too much fuss to have chocolates. Hence why I have a chocolate addiction at the moment.、Um, by the way, you are allowed to laugh because it is quite humorous. But for me, it was again. My mother wasn't there. I. Grew up between Italy and Saudi Arabia as a child. That's my mother holding me as a baby in the deserts of Saudi Arabia. So I grew up in the West most of my life, and I remember thinking FGM was okay because I remember my first day in school, the girls came up to me in the playground and said, "Oh, Leila, have you been through Gudnin? Gudnin means FGM in Somali." And I said yes, and the first thing they said was, "Oh, we can play with her now." And I remember thinking. Oh, it's okay then, because imagine, as a seven-year-old, that really meant a lot to me. The idea of no one playing with me, no one would touch anything you touch. You're considered dirty. You're considered you'll be stigmatized by the community. Myself and 200 million other women are living with this practice today. Three million alone are at risk in the African continent. Half a million. Are living in Europe as we speak. FGM, it's a global issue. We are seeing women from Colombia to Russia to South Asia to Malaysia, Indonesia, British girls like myself. 
every 11 seconds, a girl will undergo this practice. So imagine, by the time I come off this stage, how many girls would have undergone this practice. I'm in this space today because somebody, a woman called Jennifer Bourne, created a safe space for me. All she did was ask me the question that many were scared to ask. Miss Hussein, can I check if you've undergone this practice? My response was, oh yes, of course I did. I didn't have the worst type of FGM, because there are different types. There's a pricking, cutting, to removing the clitoris to all the labias, and then closing the whole vagina to a point where you're left with a small opening and there's not even a match that can get through. You're expected to urinate, menstruate, have intercourse and give birth at some point. Imagine the physical consequences of that. You cannot urinate, you cannot have menstru menstruation like everybody else. Would you believe many millions of girls have died because of this? Imagine a seven-year-old dying of a heart attack. Imagine a seven-year-old dying of hemorrhaging. The, psych the psychological impact it has left on me, I might not have had the worst type, but I remember I was pinned down by women I trusted, meaning I lost trust with a lot of people at this point. I've had flashbacks during my pregnancy. Every time I was vaginally examined, I was having flashbacks. A lot of the, a lot of the women like myself suffer from postnatal depression, sexual dysfunction. And a lot of you in this room are thinking, why would anyone practice this? People give you many reasons. FGM, people tell you it's for a religious reason, it's for a cultural reason, it's part of their identity. It's practiced across all religions. But none of the holy books mention FGM. None of the holy books mention FGM. For me, it took my little girl when she was born, Firuz. Any of you guys have a teenager at home? Oh, they're so much fun, aren't they? Oh, I love the silences she gives me. It means I get to watch Netflix in peace without being disturbed. It's quite great. But Faye, my baby, came into my life, and it was this particular health professional who asked me that question, and I said, no, it wasn't a big deal. And then she said, no, Miss Hussein, you were experiencing flashback. That's what happened to you. I remember being in her room for about 20 minutes, but by the time I walked away, I knew FGM was wrong, I knew what happened to me. Most importantly, I walked away knowing that my Feyerus was not going to undergo this practice. But how did that happen? Because she created a safe space for me. I ended up training as a psychotherapist, and for me, what I wanted as a therapist was to create a safe space where women could come and finally recognize what I recognized in that space. And this is where my campaigning work really changed. Because people call it culture, religion, or other, issue, other reasons they give. It looks beautiful, I've heard. FGM, fundamentally, it's one of the worst forms of child abuse. It's a form of sexual abuse. I also would add by saying it's one of the worst forms of sexual assaults. Just picture this. A child in this room, we bring them on stage, we pin them on this floor, spread their legs apart, just t touching their genitals, you have committed many crimes. So the cutting comes afterwards. So for me, when I came, when I got involved in this work, I realized everybody was tiptoeing around this subject. I said, no. So the narrative of my work was we need to change the language that we use when we talk about FGM. This is about oppressing women. It's about oppressing women's bodies. It's about controlling women's sexuality. And that's a global issue. That's not an African issue. That is not an Asian issue. That's a global issue. For me, it's, um, again, when we do this, is recognizing the women who stand with me when I do this work. And the men, too. And again, you know, when I said this is a global issue, and look at the world that we're living in right now. It's not a place that it's safe for women. So FGM is just a headline, as far as I'm concerned. I would like you to meet these amazing women. I've created a platform called The Face of Defiance. These are women who not only have undergone FGM, but they've experienced other issues. 
Face of defiance is we have survived. Like I said, many of us should have died that day, but we didn't. And let me tell you, <laughs> I'm a great example why FGM never worked. <laughs> I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't.、Um, I wasn't supposed to have a voice. I wasn't supposed to be sexually free. I wasn't supposed to have any sexual urges. You bring Ildis Elba's、uh, poster, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> so, like I said, it's about control. Face of Defiance was to tell the stories of amazing women who have done it. We don't want to be told what to do. We know what we need to do. The solution is already there. The answer is to invest in these women. Sari and Kamara protected four of her daughters from FGM. Hada, in the middle, she's a sexual health nurse. Because of FGM, she can't have children now, but she protected her nieces from this. So, Dahlia Project and Face of Defiance is not just about telling positive stories; it's a place of prevention. My friend Isa, who's one of the amazing midwives in the country, who's also a survivor, she creates these spaces. How a Cisse, you know, two decades ago, she protected her daughter from this. So my daughter is not the first one who was protected, except we just didn't share these positive stories. We like to share the negative. Yes, we need to share the negative, but in order for us to have any solutions, we need to know there is hope out there. The girl in the middle. I don't want to get too emotional. She's my sister.、Um, she's the one who was.、Uh, sorry. <sighs> okay. I named my daughter after my sister Feiruz. I still have nightmares about that scream. But my sister's raising two boys. And working with men is so important because we were cut for men, so men need to speak out. You have to speak out because you are the fathers, you are decision makers. You play a key role in this. So my sister's raising two amazing boys, two feminist boys, if I might add. <clears throat> two feminist boys. So it's important that we tell these stories, and. My friend Hibo, who's on this side, he was another campaign in London, protected her daughters at the forefront. And the reason I like to share these pictures with you is because I think I should have a squad like Taylor Swift does. <laughs> I'm sorry, if she gets to have one, I should have one too. And it's a way of saying I don't do this on my own. And let me tell you, I have more pictures, but I just don't have time to show it to you today. But it's by saying there's a team behind me. So my action for all of you is: if we need to start protecting our daughters from harm, we need to invest in our girls. Our daughters don't need to alter any part of their bodies to be accepted. We don't. They don't need that. So my question to all of you. It's are you all going to be part of this squad that's going to end all forms of harm against women, against women and girls? Because that's how we're going to end FGM. We have to end all of it. So who's with me on this one? <laughs> this is my daughter Fers, my teenager. Do you remember the first picture my mum was holding on to me? So this is—I would like to end with this picture: my mother, me holding on to my daughter. We're both two mums who want to make a better world for our children. And my mother chose a different path. But what we celebrate today is the fact that Firuz is not just free from female genital mutilation; she's free from all forms of oppression against women and girls. Thank you. <laughs>